Welcome to Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein, and I'm your host for this segment, sponsored by the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation, where we highlight interesting faculty and students and their activities at NPS here in Monterey. Today, for our first segment, we have Captain Wayne P. Hughes, uh, an emeritus dean at our school, as well as a longtime professor of operations research. Wayne, welcome. Thank you. Now, Wayne, I'm going to read some things here before I ask you a question. I just want to say that, uh, just highlight some of the things in your career. You've been a career naval officer commanding two ships. You've advised Navy leadership uh, while in uniform about the future of our Navy. You continue to serve the Navy through education at the Naval Postgraduate School's uh, classes, lectures, and seminars as a professor of practice in the Operations Research Department. You served as a dean at the Naval Postgraduate School. You are a fellow in the Military Operations Research Society, and you've won numerous teaching and writing awards. Why, we could spend our entire time just on those accomplishments uh, themselves. But today we're going to focus on one specific thing, your international recognition as a tactician and as a author on fleet tactics. So let's start with some basics first. Try to explain to us what the difference between naval tactics and naval strategy is. Strategy, conventionally, and uh, is about a ends, way, ends, ways, and means to accomplish uh, the ends. Mm -hmm. uh, thus, the ways are usually a campaign plan to be executed, and the means are the forces that are assigned to do that. So this is a plan. This is thinking. Mm -hmm. Tactics are doing. Tactics are the things that you uh, fight with, and fight by. Well, uh, you wrote this first book on uh, fleet tactics, theories, and practice. This is my copy uh, that you signed in 1991 for me when I was uh, a much more junior officer. Um, tell us why did you originally write this book on fleet tactics, and how, how was the distribution? Where did it go? I talked to a friend at the War College. And I said, do you know of any recent American book on fleet tactics? And last thing I can find was written in 1942, and this was in 1984. Uh, <clears throat> he said, no, I can't think of one. Uh, there, have been, there was an Italian who wrote a fine book, and, uh, but no American. So I said, let's collaborate. Well, uh, it, in the end, he died, so I had to finish the book myself. But the intent was to update our thinking on how to fight battles. Now, the structure of this book and the follow-on book and the third edition, which we will be focusing on a little bit, talks about constants and variables in naval tactics. Can you explain a little bit about that? I didn't want to talk about philosophy of war. Yeah. Um, in the appendix to the book, you'll find two lists of philosophies of war uh, and there are about 20 since the time of Sun Tzu on right up until our own uh, doctrinal statements. Uh, I, I thought tactics as something you do uh, would be best understood if we didn't prepare to fight the last war and that meant you had to get the sweep of war and that meant looking at uh, what was changing, that is to say the trends of warfare and constants, the things that were sturdy, for example, a trend has been the increasing range of our weapons, the increasing delivery accuracy capable now, the long-range scouting that's available to us. A constant would be the importance of leadership uh, in all ages and the importance of having trained and fierce combatants. Now, uh, you wrote this book in the 80s, Fleet Tactics, Theory and Practice. It was uh, well distributed throughout the Navy and received. Uh, did it also go overseas? <clears throat> yes. Uh, after the Falklands War, the Argentines translated into Spanish. Uh, the, uh, For the audience uh, who doesn't know, the Argentines didn't win that war, so they went back to school is what you're saying. And I figured if they fought again, they'd probably win this time. <laughs> okay. And uh, well, we're sure the Soviet Union uh, translated, but they never got permission to do that. Uh, when the second edition came on, there were uh, lots and lots of translations. Well, I mean, let's look at the second uh, edition. This is uh, Fleet Tactics uh, now and with coastal combat. So what motivated you write a second edition? What's the difference between the first edition and the second? What update? First of all, I wrote the first edition to be timeless. Uh, 
it was supposed to be durable. <laughs> uh, I should have known better because uh, new technology always forces new tactics to accompany it. And uh, once I knew that, I knew that a second edition was inevitable. The second was a surprise with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, I became aware of how much of the focus on the first edition had been on fighting the Soviet Union uh, in, in blue water. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, then I needed to change things, and the new focus was going to be on the literal waters, on the coastal waters, on uh, supporting operations along the coast, and so it was natural. But that was a surprise. Now, uh, most historically, as you've taught me, most naval battles occur in the littorals or near the shore, not necessarily in blue water. The exceptions, uh, the rare exceptions were like World War I and some World War II, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, World War II and some World War I battles. But now you focus on the littorals in certain uh, important uh, coastal areas in the world that you think it's important for us to be able to influence uh, with our fleet and our capability. Can you go over some of those it areas? It wouldn't hurt the name of some. Right. Uh, of course, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, because China is developing not only a, a, a coastal defense capability, but they're dabbling in sea control now. Uh, the Yellow Sea, because of the Koreans, uh, and the Sea of Japan on the other side of the coast because of the Russians as well. Uh, the uh, Arabian or Persian Gulf is a, is a natural, and uh, we must be attending to that because as missiles come into business, uh, uh, it'll be more and more hazardous to, to, to uh, um, fight there. Uh, also, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and the Baltic, uh, and that's a if we can deal with those regions, then we will be able to deal with anything. And in your view, why is it more difficult to fight in those littorals than it is in blue water? Because you can uh, conceal yourself. Uh, there are in, in the and so can the enemy. <laughs> and, and so can the enemy. Right. Yes. Uh, for example, just Sweden has ten thousand islands. Indonesia has thirteen thousand islands. Norway has fjords. These are places for concealment. Also, there's coastal traffic, uh, fishing boats, and uh, coastal trade. And if your combatants are similar in size, then the, 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 uh, you or the enemy can lose themselves until they spring out at you and conduct surprise attack. So surprise attack, shorter range, and, and deadliness are characteristic in, uh, in these coastal waters more than in blue water. Okay, now we go from the second edition to what you've just completed, and uh, the publisher has it now in order to get it out. It's the third edition. What motivated you th to add things to this third edition, and what did you add? The, uh, the, the main thing that uh, everybody is aware of in the armed forces is the rise of information warfare. Uh, so there's a whole chapter devoted to information warfare both in war and peace, both in the commercial world and in the military world, and then there are some applications of, of information warfare for, for, for tactics. Uh, the second change came about because it occurred to me that we've been uh, <coughs> conducting operations steadily since 1950, but we haven't fought a battle at sea. There have been no American fleet tactics, so we, all of our experience has been vicarious, the Arab-Israeli wars and the Pakistan-Indian wars. And, and so I thought I should show the connection between uh, tactics, fleet tactics, and naval operations. And so you added that chapter as well. So there's a new chapter on naval operations. And uh, with that new uh, material in the book, uh, what started you thinking about this? Did, who inspired you to actually write this? Well, that's interesting. Uh, the, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson, was here, and uh, he invited me to breakfast. And I knew CNOs don't invite you to breakfast without some purpose. <laughs> it depends on who's paying, but go right ahead. <laughs> so uh, I, I said, can I help you, sir? And, and he said, yes, I want a third edition of Fleet Tactics. And, and I, I, I said, what would you like to include in it? And he said, information warfare. I see. And you had a co-author? Uh, I have a, uh, 
asked Bob Garrier, Admiral Retired Bob Garrier, to be co-author, uh, and he's been a, just a, a tremendous help. He's had more fleet experience than me. He's uh, conversant with the Pacific Theater especially, and his last active duty tour was developing unmanned vehicles, which I categorize as part of information warfare. Great, and he will uh, carry that flame on in case there's a fourth edition that's required, or a fifth, right? If there's a fourth edition, I'll be dead. <laughs> and so <laughs> we'll let uh, Bob Garrier, and, and he's ready now. Uh, I, I, he's read every word, he has improved every word, no. He has improved the, 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 the content, and, and uh, it's going to be a, 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 a a, a better edition, if well, that's possible. Let's go back to the content chapters for a minute. You, you mentioned information warfare because it's so important today. Um, but tell us, uh, how does that fit in with the constant and trend theme that you had in the first edition? Is information warfare a constant or is it a trend? Or did you integrate that in at all? Uh, it's a little of both, but uh, importantly, uh, the trend in information warfare, more and more of it, is accelerating right now, and so it's very important to. And I should talk about what that embraces in in our understanding. Uh, I, I've mentioned unmanned vehicles, but it also includes uh, artificial intelligence, uh, more ways to exploit deception, uh, and uh, so the variety of applications is uh, is extensive. Now, you also mentioned that you added a chapter on naval operations. Um, uh, mainly because of the experiences that we've had over the last 50 years as a fleet. Uh, what uh, major elements are in that chapter or lessons that we can pull from that chapter? I, I think the, the main thing is to distinguish uh, operations, which to me is a peacetime phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And you and I have t taught campaign analysis, and when and we define campaign analysis as as when the shooting starts. Um, so when we study it, we assume the, the shooting is going on and then we uh, explore ways to do that as efficiently as possible. Uh, but operational planning uh, is keeping the peace and, and preventing war and influencing the enemy and our friends around the world so that we don't have to go to war. Well, you sort of led into my next question was try to distinguish the, between the difference of uh, naval operations and naval campaigns yeah. because we have been teaching campaign analysis and in your mind that naval campaign is either increased tensions or actual war is that right yeah, yeah. and the principles associated with uh, the naval operations sometimes can be bled into the naval campaign or uh, are they completely separate different well one of the things that challenged me was to think about the constants and trends of naval operations so in addition to talking about Constants, what uh, don't doesn't change over history, and what and trends, what does change. And by the way, there's a third component too, called I call variables, which is things that you don't know until you're at the edge of battle. And uh, and uh, I point out that it's very important, and and only the tactical commander who's on the scene can can execute the variables having profited from understanding the constants and trends. But in Naval Operations chapter, I uh, develop constants and trends for, for at the campaign level and the operational level. Right. Now, you mentioned that Admiral Richardson inspired you to write the book. Have you had communication with him since then, after you've now finished that draft? Um, indeed we have, and uh, uh, I've induced him to write the foreword. Oh, great. <laughs> so you put him to work. <laughs> I figured he owed me. That's right. And, and he came through and, and, and has written a foreword which uh, points out some of the things we've been talking about, the, the importance of information warfare in the modern era and the importance of uh, getting us back on the step uh, in, in the tactical domain. Uh, we, we both think that there's some doing to be done in the fleet to, to establish uh, a more distributable fleet and a more offensive capability. Uh, and particularly in the literal types environment. Particularly in the literal types environment. Which brings me to my next question. In the second edition you have this imaginary battle that unfolds the Battle of the Aegean. Can you explain a little bit uh, about that battle and why you put it in the book and what lessons were to derive from it? Uh, I, uh, let me take a few minutes. Uh, 
<laughs> the Battle of the Aegean replaced the Second Battle of the Nile, and it, it, the focus was on uh, coastal regions. Uh, and uh, the, the scenario says that the Greeks and the Turks, who are much like brothers but can't stand each other, uh, are about to go to war. And the Turks, we have found out through intelligence, have a very clever plan uh, centered on Cyprus and then on retaking the Greek islands that are right abutted up to the, to the, to the Turkish coast. And, and the Turks hate this, mm -hmm. um, at least in the scenario. Um, I apologize to the Turks because they, they're our friends, but uh, we used to pretend to fight the British too, so uh, <laughs> uh, they, they were a good foil and they are a challenging opponent. Right. Uh, so uh, we uh, confront them uh, and say, uh, do not uh, attack Cyprus, which is part of their clever plan, uh, and, uh, and then we put four uh, modern uh, cruisers and destroyers there, and lo and behold, they uh, are not deterred. They attack with missiles, and they put uh, one of the cruisers out of action, and the second one goes to aid it, and it's out of action, and then the, the other two come, and they have to uh, help the, the crippled ships out of the theater. So now the Turks think, oh boy, now we can invade Cyprus, and they, they head out there, and they're a couple of SSNs there who sink the uh, Turkish amphibious ships. So that sets up the main part of the scenario then, which is uh, we have to stop the uh, Turks from conducting amphibious uh, landings against the islands. And, and how we do that is the rest of the book. And, and it's very uh, ingenious uh, involving missile ships on our side. And we must fight outnumbered. and. Uh, uh, one force is a decoy force and probably will be plastered. So when you say missile ships, you mean small combatants that small, fight in the literal Small system. combatants yeah. armed uh, and numerous. <clears throat> so in, in this case, the scenario itself was to bring home the points of uh, that fleet numbers matter and missiles matter on those fleet numbers, and the literal is a complex and challenging environment. And one more point, I think, uh, is transferable to the Baltic and to the China Seas, and that is um, we wanted to keep the war from spilling over onto tur the Turkish mainland. Right. Uh, so the, the goal is to execute a maritime strategy that will prevent the war from getting out of control and, and, and turning big, which is what we also want to do in having a maritime strategy against Russia and, and China. Well, Wayne, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you a quick question. What is the next era of warfare at sea. We're just catching up uh, in the U.S. Navy with the last warfare era, which was missile warfare. As you can uh, see, if you've assimilated this conversation, um, it's going to be uh, about c cyber warfare and robotic warfare. Robotics and cyber. Captain Wayne P. Hughes, Jr., thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to that third edition of Fleet Tactics as it comes out. And we thank you for joining us at the Your Town Television program, sponsored by the MPS Foundation.